this little section D kind of gets to my own internal transformation. By power, oops, by power to Robinson in Haiti from Phillipsburg, New Jersey, to what I constructed for myself here in New York, the day painting of Columbia and the Upper West Side. Um, I come from Phillipsburg, New Jersey, a grim little steel town in the northwestern corner of the state. And when I was growing up, I could see a sliver of the Delaware River from the top step of my back door stoop. But only in the winter, when the trees were there, and only after mill hours, when the air cleared up. A freight line ran along the riverfront on the Jersey side of the Delaware, and my friends and I were forbidden to play there. With great conspiratorial fervor, transparent to our parents, I'm sure, we would bike down to the tracks after school and goof around, or just sit on the rails and stare at the water until the freight yard guards chased us away. We were bookish, nerd kids, my buddies and I. More than once, we did our homework on the tracks. To venture to the river and be shooed away by men in uniform made us feel, for an hour or so before dinner time, like badasses. Then one summer, a boy in our elementary school, Bob Frankenfield, whose older brother Butch later married my big sister Barbara, drowned in the Delaware. And the dangers of the riverside no longer seemed so romantic. Much has been made in Bruce Springsteen's songs of the thrill of crossing the Hudson River for kids from New Jersey. When I moved to Manhattan in the mid 70s to go to NYU, I thought of the Hudson in those Springsteenish terms as no more than a symbol of a border that I thought I had crossed, an imagined line between youth and adulthood, between provincialism and cosmopolitanism. Few cliches, few cliches about coming to New York are more commonplace in and out of Bruce Springsteen songs. Since college, I've lived mostly on the Upper West Side, and I've done a great deal of my work, my reading, my writing, my musing about what to write in Riverside Park. Working in the park, I found myself reminded from time to time of the poorest line between music and daydreaming. The park bench, unlike, faces the river, and sometimes I find the steady, endless rolling of the water along the way to dreaming. I like to think of this state as conducive to epiphany, although more often leads in my case to maps. The strip of the Hudson that divides Manhattan and New Jersey is not a typical river, but is rather a tidal estuary in ebbs and flows. As I understand the Mohicans call it by a phrase that meant the river that runs both ways. Every year runs both ways, it goes both ways. In the At this time of year, it's not uncommon, um, I read this, and I want to to see hunks of ice drifting up, upstream toward the river's sources upstate for self-styled contrarians like me. And for that matter, the rest of the New York population, the majestically freaky, almost unnatural nature of the Hudson makes it seem just the right kind of river to have alongside of us. Riverside Parley, uh, Park was deeply important in the create, uh, creative lives of my two, two of my idols. <coughs> The fact that it's no doubt informed my own ardor for the park. The reclusive jazz composer Billy Strangle, and the subject of my first book, Lush Life, lived for many years in what was once the Master Hotel, a lush Art Deco tower on the Riverside Drive and West Island Third Street, in front of which I sit in the room. He spent most mornings and a great many afternoons reading books and writing music in the park on benches somewhere around the one I've chosen, I think. Strayhorn gave one and only concert under his own name during his abbreviated lifetime, an event staged right here. One and only concert he ever gave was here, not long before he died, and he called the band he had organized just for the occasion, the Riverside Drive Five. In the early 1990s, the drummer Oliver Jackson, Strayhorn's friend and neighbor, told me about meeting Strayhorn in the park. Yes. Jackson said, quote, I'd sit on the bench with him and we'd talk while the kids were playing. One day I saw him in the park with a big sheet of music paper. And I asked him what he was writing. He said, oh, it was something for strings. I said, what? I looked down at the music paper, paper and it was a complete orchestral score. He was writing a symphonic piece right there in his head, sitting in the park on the piano. Stefan Papelli, the French jazz violinist, once talked to Strayhorn about what the river meant. Propelli said, quote, we walked along the Seine. I was telling him how much I loved the river 
and how I love to look at it as it ran through the city. Though he said it seemed to him to be, he said, the essence of life, carrying life through the city and beyond it, he said. He was very thoughtful. He looked sad. And I said, Billy, what are you thinking? He said, I think when I die, I want my ashes thrown into the river by my house in New York City. After Strayhorn's death in May 1967, a small group of his friends gathered on a pier at the 79th Street boat basin and emptied an urn of his remains into the Hudson. Now, I prepared, there's, this actually goes on and talks about Ralph Ellison, uh, but for the sake of brevity, I think I'll end, and I'll, uh, <coughs> I'll tell the conclusion of that little story about the day that um, Strayhorn died and had his, uh, his ashes acting into the river from there. Um, after he died, his collaborator and uh, musical partner and uh, uh, Duke Allenton uh, seemed uh, untouched by Strayhorn's death. And he didn't mourn publicly and he didn't like to talk about uh, Strayhorn, and many of the people who were closest to the two of them found this offensive. And uh, um, here, after Strayhorn died, a number of his friends had a little memorial service to remember. Not a memorial service. They, uh, they gathered, re they gathered again at the boat base to remember their friend, and they, they talked a little bit about him and said some things and the guy in the boat, and I interviewed all the people who were there, and they told me about this years later, the fellow in the boat, the boat said, excuse me folks, why are you here? And they said, oh, well, a friend of ours died, and we had a memorial service for him a year ago, and we'll remember him again. The guy said, oh, I just wondered, because there was just another guy here. And they looked up, and it was too young. He had come down alone, privately to remember that he was straight. Um, and, uh, that's all I want to read. Thank you. Oh.